over and we'll sing. I will sing a wonder story. And what a story it is. <laughs>
Upon being released, she found a church, and about a week later, she became saved and found Jesus Christ as her Savior. The story kind of continues and goes on because later, her and her husband went back to Alaska and they began to operate the Artie Cache Rehabilitation Center. You see, every time you snap your fingers, don't work too good, could have snapped them. But every time you snap your fingers, that's about twice every second, somewhere in the world, a Gideon is placed in the scripture. Some of them are like this, I'm sure you've all seen those. In the hands of somebody that doesn't know the Lord is their Savior. So that's two scriptures every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the Gideons International have been doing that for about 100 years. The Gideons, they make God's Word available in those traffic lanes of everyday life where churches, denominations, and other missionaries may not be able to go. Uh, you've heard a lot of them. I know you guys know we put them in hotels, motels, convalescent homes, uh, distributed schools, hospitals, armed forces. This is a very big uh, campaign of ours to make sure everyone in the armed forces has an opportunity to have a Bible. So that's what the Gideons do in those traffic lanes of life. Actually, the Gideons can work in many countries where the traditional missionaries, excuse me, aren't even able to go. So they're not allowed to get in there, but because we have camps set up in that country with citizens in that country, they're able to go and pass out God's word in countries where they normally wouldn't let anybody with Christians be in there. All these testimonies and everything that's been given is, is just a testimony of the document of truth about Isaiah 55, 11, and I'd like to share that with you. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. See, every Gideon is a born-again Christian business or professional man who is a member of a local church just like yours. Today, the Gideon's International Ministry includes almost 200,000 members in 193 countries throughout the world. And Bibles are printed in 93 languages right now. Uh, by God's grace, last year, trying to catch up with my new figures here, uh, Gideon's placed over 79 million scriptures. We're trying to hit 80 million, but it didn't happen. But 79 million scriptures were placed last year. Our purpose is simple. It's to partner with you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world in dire need in it. So together, when we partner with the local churches, we have a mission field of 193 countries that we can serve through this mission. In El Salvador, Gideons were offering New Testaments to children in school. They did morning and afternoon sessions. It was a very large complex. Well, after the morning session went, everything went well, but the Gideons came back for the afternoon session, and they noticed a lot of these scriptures were torn up, and there was pages all over them. So they did their best. They picked everything up and got ready, and the afternoon distrib distribution went very well. As so they're going back into town, they stopped by this small store in the edge of town to get them some refreshments to drink. As they were coming up the stairs, sitting on the steps was a young man. He was crying. He was holding one of those single pages out of those scriptures. And he seen the Gideons uh, approaching, and he said, You've got to tell me more about this man named Jesus. I I've read what I have, and I need to know more. So a couple of Gideons stayed there with him and explained to him our Lord Jesus Christ. And the others went on inside the store. Well, as they got inside the store, there was a little older man in there. And he was upset. And he seen the men come in, and he says, you've got to tell me more about this Jesus. That's my boy outside. I have never seen him act like that before. So the other Gideons explained to him, talked to him, got the father and son together. And so that day, both father and son received Christ as our Savior. I think about the testimony of Carrie Christie. She had no real Christian influence in her life. Actually said her family was mostly agnostic or atheist. But while she was out in a hotel one time with a group, she noticed the Gideon Bible there, and she kept it. She had to hide it from her parents. So at night with a flashlight, she'd read that Bible throughout the years. Well, she graduated from high school, went on to college, and she went off and became friends with this Christian girl who witnessed to her. And she had a lot of questions. Well, that young Christian girl explained to her all those things she'd been reading in that Bible for those years. And Carrie became to know the Lord loved her, and she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And that wasn't the end of her story either. During the years that followed, nearly all of Carrie's family came to know the Lord, including her mother, just shortly before she passed away. It's such a simple idea, given a New Testament to someone or put in a Bible in a hotel room, yet it's an incredible, effective way to share God's Word. See, millions of people have never heard the good news. And many will never be able to own their own copy of scriptures unless one is given to them. 
It's so easy for us to obtain Bibles, it's hard sometimes for us to understand how important it is to people around the world. But that's how it is in Thailand. When God's Word to so many people in countries such as Thailand, the children are so happy to get them and actually bow their heads and raise their hands to receive their book and their scriptures. In many countries, that's the only book the children will have. And that was the case in Guam, where a group of Gideons were distributed more than 300,000 scriptures in a little over two weeks. We call it a blitz. And that's where Gideons will come from all over the world, help those Gideon camps in that area, and they hit that entire city and put out those scriptures in about two weeks. After one of the distributions, the teacher told the Gideons, they will read and understand this Bible because I'm their, their reading teacher. And this is going to become our textbook. She said, you may not know this, but this little Bible you gave these children is the first book they've ever been able to call their own. So she said that uh, God must have known we needed you. He must have sent you here today. When are you coming back? You see, there's more than 500 schools in that city alone and about 600,000 children still waiting to get their testaments. So when will we go back? Where will we go next? Even though we're placing and distributing more than two scriptures every second, the need is even greater. And you may be wondering how you can help. The number one need, obviously, for us is prayer. Keep these doors open, even in our country and around the world, where we can get into these countries and get into places to distribute these where we know we need to be because of governments and things we can't get in. So prayer is the number one thing we need. If God has placed it on your heart, uh, you can give a financial gift. An example, these little Bibles that you've seen everywhere we pass out, the costs are still being held down to about $1.30 apiece. So for every $130 we get, it takes a box of 100 and ships it anywhere around the world. And 100% of the donations we get go to placing and purchasing Bibles. None of the overhead or anything is taken out of that money. Another way you can, can I see you guys have a, uh, a card uh, rack back here. Many of you have used this in other churches, I know. It's just a card in recognition of whatever you want it to be in. It can be achievement, graduation, birthdays, in remembrance of. The cards are free. It's a more explanation down there how you use them. You just fill them out and you want to, want to do it in behalf of. And you write down the amount you want to. And it places Bibles around the world in honor of that person, wherever it may be. Let's see what else we got here. This that's kind of wrapping it up. If, uh, the, you know, the hotel Bibles, I like to tell you what they cost too. We've had those questions before. A hotel Bible, even those larger Bibles, we can do print those around and get them placed for about five bucks a piece. And the hotel Bibles, while they're in a hotel, will reach about 2,300 people in their lifetime. So that's how your money is being used and how the money is, is handled and, and everything goes forward and is, is distributed. Again, every, hundred, every dollar, every dime that we get and receive goes for purchasing and distributing scriptures somewhere around the world. Pastor, thanks for having us here. It's great to be here in this new church. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, I know many of you, love all of you, and uh, thanks for letting us be here. Thanks for giving me the attention and being part of your service today, and God bless everyone here. Thanks. Thank you. They're set up if you wish to donate. They, you know, they have so many different ways you can donate. They have recognition program, uh, a recognition program. If somebody does something you want to recognize them, you can donate a Bible or some money in the, uh, the name of the Gideons, etc., etc. Um, we don't pass a, a, an offering plate here at, at New Life, and uh, so you can give something on the way out if that's your, if, if the Lord lays that on your heart. The Gideons are well worth your support, so I would endorse their program. This morning, uh, I told you last week it was, or on Mother's Day, I said it was very hard for me to find good Mother's Day jokes, and this is one I had to reject. But since it's not Mother's Day, I can use this one now. <laughs> so, Edward and his wife, Frances, and his mother-in-law, Agnes, went on a safari to Africa. And one evening, while they were deep, deep in the jungle, Frances awoke to find her mother, Agnes, missing. 
Rushing to Edward, she insisted on trying to find her mother, even though it was dark out. Sighing heavily, Edward picked up his rifle and his flashlight and started off to search for Agnes. Soon, in a clearing not far away, they came upon a most frightening sight. Agnes, the mother-in-law, was backed up against a thick, impenetrable bush, and a large male lion was standing facing her. Frances cried out in panic, Edward, what are we going to do? Edward, in a calm voice, said, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. The lion got himself into this mess. <laughs> Let him get himself out. <laughs> you can see why we use that for Mother's Day. <laughs> but it's fair game now. So we return this morning to our study of Romans, and uh, we're in uh, chapter 5, and we've been studying Paul's words, where here in chapter 5 he's changed his focus of his writing from death to life, and Paul has started contrasting the actions of Adam and Jesus, and I, and I forgot to announce Children's Church, if you have a child in the first grade or younger, you can have them go to Children's Church now. We have a couple of children's church age kids, and they don't have to go, but they can go. <coughs> Jerry's ready for them. Okay, so, but Paul has begun to contrast Adam and Jesus, and we looked at one area of contrast was in the effectiveness of their actions. By the offense of Adam, mankind died, at least in a spiritual sense. And thus, the offense of Adam was very effective. But in the sacrifice of Christ, there is even greater effectiveness. It, it, in that, I mean, his actions superseded all that went before it in regards to the consequences of Adam's action. The gift of Jesus Christ did much more than any offense could ever do. And when you think about that, that makes perfect sense because God's grace is more powerful than any man's sin. After all, He is God. The second area of contrast that we've already looked at looks at the, the area of extent of the actions. See, God hates sin so much that the single action of Adam, his single sin, has condemned the entire human race. That's an action that has great extent. But then again, God's hatred of sin is outweighed by one thing, His love for each one of us. So while Adam's act condemned us all to death, we still have the opportunity for justification. That is to be seen in God's eyes the way God sees His Son. And that is of greater extent than anything anyone else could do. So now this morning we're going to continue on with these series of contrasts that Paul's been making. And our source scripture this morning is Romans 5, 17 through 21. Romans 5, 17 through 21. If you're ready for the Word of God, please signify that by saying Amen. Amen. And please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Romans 5, 17 reads, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through, through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by, for as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by the one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. 
But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you. You can be seated. Our next area of contrast, the, the third contrast that Paul makes in these, in these verses, is uh, the, between the act of Adam and the action of Christ is in their efficacy. And efficacy is just a, a religious term that simply means the capacity to produce a desired result. It comes from the word effective, and that's what it means. Does something effectively do what it's supposed to do? And as Paul has already noted in the previous verses of 12 through 14, the sin of one man brought about the reign of death. So it, it, it is to that truth that the word if, in verse 17, look back in our source scripture to, this morning in 517, it says if, let me read that for you, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one that word if really in the Greek carries more of a connotation of because. So if you read that, that verse, for because by one man's death, of, uh, one man, the offense came into the world. He, he committed an offense which caused death in the world. And we've established that Adam's one act of sin brought the reign of death. We've established that fact already. But... Was that the intent of Adam and Eve? Was that their desire? What did Adam and Eve want when they committed this one sin, sin that they committed? Neither one of them desired death. What they really desired is that they had a desire to become like God. That was their desire. But, and it's a, this, is a, this is a big uh, idea here, they were so deceived by the great tempter, Satan, the end results of their desire were turned 180 degrees backwards. Instead of becoming more like God, they became more unlike God. Remember, prior to the, their sin, they were able to commune with God. But after their sin, they fled at the sound of his voice. So we know that uh, Adam's sin effectively brought about death that we all inherited from him. The one act of the man, though, Jesus Christ, the man God, Jesus Christ, produced precisely the results that were desired. Adam and Eve did something because they wanted something and it produced an opposite effect. Jesus Christ did something and it did exactly what he wanted it to do. The divine result of Jesus' action, the sacrifice of himself, was exactly as it was predestined. He went to the cross and our source scripture today says, those who receive the abundance the abundance of the unmatched gift of grace and of the gift of righteousness would reign in life through the one who died for them, Jesus Christ. See, Adam's action was very one-dimensional in, in the way it worked, death. But the action of Jesus Christ is multi-dimensional. By that I mean the results of your acceptance of Jesus Christ have results now in your life, and they will have results forever in your life. Christ not only offers us life here on earth, He offers us abundant life. What does the second half of John 10.10 10 says? I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. The redeemed in Christ not only receive abundant life, but that was they also receive, and don't, don't forget this, you get righteousness, it says, as a gift. You get righteousness as a gift. So, it's important that we hang on to that thought, that we understand that 
in the actions of Jesus Christ, it is multidimensional, the things that we receive from Him. But in a practical sense, the practical use of this grace truth is that the one who has granted us spiritual life is going to fulfill that life in you. What does Philippians 1.6 say? Philippians 1.6, Paul writes, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. And that's the process you're supposed to be on today. That's the process we're supposed to be working today. That completion of the Spirit's work in our life. Okay? And it will be completed. When we go to be with our Father, that work will be completed. But we should be in the process each and every day. That's the multidimensional effect of the action of Jesus Christ. Uh, God is a transformer of life. God is a fulfiller of life. Again, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Are you all new today? Have all the old things passed away? <coughs> Our source scripture talks about to reign in life, it speaks of. Through Christ, we have that idea of reigning over life is the idea of having power over sin. Later in Romans, Paul will write in the, the sixth chapter, 17 and 18 verses, he says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of rock doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin. That's not future tense. That's present tense. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness, he said. As believers, we know now from our experiences, and we know from the scriptures, that we are plagued still by sin. We still have this this flesh that is the sinful rags of what we are, but the difference is, is that sin should not be your nature, and sin should not be your master. And sin is the master of the world. For those that know, don't know Jesus Christ, sin is their master. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, who gives us, it says, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to live our lives as if we have victory over sin. That's not prosperity preaching. That's gospel preaching. That's what the gospel is. Victory over sin. It's a real victory. It should be concrete in our lives. So the efficacy, the effectiveness of the actions of Jesus Christ... The, the, the capability, the capacity to produce his desired results cannot be denied. Jesus paid a price. He paid it all. And we have victory. We just need to claim it in our lives. The next area I want to speak about and the fourth contrast that Paul writes of is the contrast in essence. The action of Adam and the action of Jesus in regards to the essence as is expressed in our source verse this morning in verses 18 and 19. Previously, we spoke of Paul's use of the word many back in verse 15. And here we find the same usage. Paul again uses the same type of usage for the word all. Just as he said many died in verse 15 which pointed to all of mankind. So life to all men here refers exclusively to those who trust in Christ. And we'll go into that a little bit deeper now. This verse has been used by some to advocate universalism. Universalism simply states that all are saved. All will be saved. You don't need to sweat all that other stuff. Everyone will be saved. That's a, a simple way to put it, but it's a, a very accurate way to put it when you read the 
doctrines of universalism. But it's abundantly clear from other parts of this epistle, and remember, the scripture can't contradict itself, that salvation only comes to those that have faith in Christ. Let me show you that. In the first chapter, verses 16 and 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And you can take that word everyone and remove it and put in the word all, for all who believe. That's Paul's writing technique here. To call into your mind so you'll understand who it is that is a child of God. So the important word, and he continues in verse 17, for it is the righteousness of God, for it, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The viable word in those verses is to believe. Again in Romans, in the third chapter, the 22nd verse, it says, Even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, who believe, there is no difference. The viable words in those verses is faith and belief. Same chapter, verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Faith is the most important word there. And then in chapter 4, verse 5, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Believe on him in faith. So it's obvious in verse 18 when it speaks of all, the all it speaks of are all those who believe. So let me ask you, do you believe? Because if you don't believe, you're just wasting your time. God won't give you any credit for coming to church and not believing on His Son. God won't give you any credit for doing good work and not believing on His Son. He sent His Son to die for you. There's a prerequisite upon your part. You have to believe. You have to believe that His Son merely died for you. That's what this is all about. It matters, folks, what you believe. It may not matter much to you. You may intellectually make a sense, yeah, there's a God, but I don't have to believe all that other stuff. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that matters. Do you have faith that Jesus died for you? Because there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a time where these answers will have to be answered. Primarily, Paul speaks of the essence here of Adam's one transgression as being founded in disobedience. He then contrasts that in verse 19. He writes that the essence of Christ's one act of righteousness was founded in obedience. Adam, disobedience. Jesus, obedience. When God commanded Adam not to eat of the, the forbidden fruit, Adam disobeyed, and he brought death unto the world. When God sent his only begotten son into the world to suffer and die, the son obeyed. He brought life. Disobedience equals death. Obedience equals life. It's a simple picture. There isn't anything on, in this gospel that's beyond man's comprehension. The word that is translated in verse 19, made, is kathisima in the Greek, and it carries the idea of constructing or establishing. If you look in verse 19, for by one man's disobedience, many more were constructed or established as sinners. That's the way that reads in the Greek. The guilt of Adam's disobedience was imputed to all of his descendants. And thus, sinners 
were born by the sin of man. They were established by the sin of Adam, by one man. Understand that uh, we were born as sinners in a legal sense in God's sight. Everyone who has not accepted Christ, everyone who has not believed in Christ as their saviors, it is in the eyes of God legally guilty. And for God there can be only one verdict to that guilt. God is just. He can only give one verdict. And that verdict will be condemnation. It is in the same way, but with the exact opposite effect, that Christ's obedience causes those who believe in Him to be made righteous in God's sight. Righteous. You have, God sees things, you know, our society wants to have this big, big gray area. We call it humanism. It's what makes us so, so, so satisfied with ourselves. But God sees things in one of two ways. God sees obedience and disobedience. God sees righteousness and unrighteousness. And it's all, it's the only way God can see. Because He is holy. He is impeccable. He is unblemished in His righteousness. And He imputes that righteousness to us. That's how, that's the only, listen to me. See, the only way that God can look upon you today, because I'm not sinless, okay? The only way that God can look upon me today and not be repulsed by who I am is by the blood of of his son, who filters the way he sees me. That's how a righteous God can call an unrighteous man his child. Amen. That's how a righteous God can hear the prayers of a mere sinner. That's how a righteous God can lift someone up from whatever the issues are in their lives, uh, whatever sin they're mired in, and bring them into an intimate relation with himself. I was telling somebody this morning, I got, a, I got an email from the Douglas Jail. I'm not sure what kind of jail is that. Is that a county jail or a state jail? Or? City jail. Is it a city jail? About from uh, from a young couple, the bo the, hus the the boyfriend is in the jail, and the girlfriend's outside of jail, and they want to they want to try to change their lives, and they said that they had spoken to many pastors in the local communities and were searching for someone that would talk to them. In essence, I said I replied to their first text, and they would text back and said they were searching for a pastor that would speak to them. Speak to them. Rejoice with them. After all, just because you're in prison doesn't mean you're beyond the reach of God. Who was David? David was a murderer. That's who David was. Was he beyond God's reach? Who was David? David was an adulterer. That's who David was. Was he beyond God's reach? And yet, we don't want to talk to people. God wants to have a relationship with you. I don't know, this is, this is as far as I'm going to be able to get today. I'm not sure what it is that some of you are waiting for. Because you know what? It is appointed unto man once to die. And it'll be too late. And, I, and if you don't think I'm, 
If you don't think I'm supposed to preach about this to you, you know what? You're wrong, because I am. This is exactly what I'm supposed to preach to you about. About a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. So the ladies are going to come forward and, and lead us in a, in a song of invitation. Because, see, you might have this wrong. You might think that it's up to you whether or not you're going to be a child of God. You know what? It's up to Him. And if He's calling, you know what? You need to perk up those ears and listen. Because He's got it. We've just read what He has for you. He has a life of abundance. He has the desire to draw you closer. He wants to be the solution to your problems. Allow His love to cause you to be filled with love. Allow Him to do that for you. So if I'm going to lead us in prayer. Then as the ladies begin the song with us today, I just pray that you will take that opportunity. As the first song, note of the song is sung, I would pray that you would take the opportunity to come forward. If God is moving on your heart today, I'm not going to guilt you into coming forward. This is a personal relationship issue between you and Him. Whatever your needs might be. Maybe you need to be spiritually baptized. Maybe you need to join the church as a church member. And maybe you need some counseling about something, anything. If this is, let's give this time to God. We have an altar here. Let's give this time to Him and allow Him to work in our hearts and in our lives. With every head bowed, every eyes closed, every eye closed, let's, let's pray. Father, we, uh, we just come before You, Lord, and we lift up this time to You. And I pray, Lord, for those that are here that don't know You in a personal way, that, that they would take this opportunity, Father. Uh, you, it, I know in my heart. There are numerous people here today that don't know you. And Lord, that, that, that feeling is placed upon my heart because of your spirit, because of who you are. So Father, we give this time to you. It's rightfully yours. It's, 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 it's a time of self-reflection. And Lord, maybe it's not an issue of salvation. Maybe it's an issue of getting our hearts straight. Maybe it's an issue, Lord, of of doing what we know we should do, becoming members and joining this body and then becoming corporately aligned with this body. Whatever the issue might be, Lord, we give, us, give you this time. We, we, we rejoice in what you will do. And Lord, we, 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 it is irrespective to us to what we see. Lord, we just desire that you work. And we will rejoice in whatever you do. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Please stand.
up on the hill or Smith Wesson. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes. 